So just to get us started, uh, let's uh, frame the discussion a little bit. What are we talking about here? Urban complexity. Um, it's these things, cities. Uh, maybe we can mute, uh, if everybody can mute their, their mic when they're not speaking, that, that'd be best, I think. Um, so yeah, cities, right? And trying to understand them from the perspective uh, of uh, complexity as kind of, as they are, as these complex systems, right? these complex adaptive systems, they look like this when we step back and look at them, these kind of uh, very organic looking networks that emerge and evolve and adapt. And uh, of course are incredibly uh, complex when you're inside them, it's all these uh, different systems uh, interacting. I think they're really uh, a paradigm and archetype of, of what we're talking about when we, when we say complex adaptive systems. Uh, and fascinating things, uh, that kind of level of complexity fascinates me and I think a lot of other people. Um, and how can we uh, really think about them in this new paradigm, this networked evolutionary systems holistic paradigm? So a couple of words here uh, by introduction. I just took this from uh, this guy, Michelle uh, Batty, UC, UCL, where they study uh, uh, urban complexity. Actually, Cobus studied there, did his PhD there. Um, so complexity theory is rapidly developed uh, during the 20th century, the 20, last 20 years. Uh, initially from the interest in general systems theory, whose application to the social sciences began in the 1960s. It's now become important in many disciplines where systems which are highly decentralized require examination from the bottom up and where the actions of individual objects and agents combine to produce patterns, morphologies and system structures which can't be explained using more aggregate theories. So that's kind of exactly what this thing is really, isn't it? This kind of bottom up emergent thing, right? No one actually planned that whole system. Uh, all these people choosing to aggregate, come together to interact. Uh, we got the emergence of these networked patterns from the bottom up. That's what they're talking about here. Um, so cities are the quintessential example of complex systems. Their patterns in spatial terms across many scales is highly ordered, but the evolution of such patterns does not depend upon some centralized authority, some hidden hand except insofar as such hidden hands emerge from the uncoordinated actions of individuals. So there's obviously some kind of higher level order and pattern emerging here. Um, you know, everyone chose to, to, to aggregate there in Delhi, but now that they've aggregated, those were kind of individual choice. Now they've aggregated there, we obviously have this thing called Delhi and it creates this overall macro kind of pattern that attracts other people and kind of organizes them. So there's that bottom up kind of top down thing as always in complex systems. Um, planning and design of cities is thus the exception rather than the rule and where planning has altered the shape, of, of, uh, shape and structure of cities, its impact is across a limited range and scales and sectors. So just saying a lot of stuff in cities happens through kind of self-organizing emergent processes and planning can shape that, can influence that, but actually uh, it's driven a lot by these kind of peer interactions. So, so um, key themes that they're talking about, they're looking at um, is the evolution of cities um, where they're examining, uh, examining scale distributions, right? How we get these kind of fractal multi-scale patterns we see here, we have teeny little networks, right? Right down here, if we're able to zoom in, we see little patterns, they emerge into larger, larger networks and then they emerge into, you know, really vast kind of global networks. Um, so they exist on many different scales and you see the same kind of patterns emerging on different scales. And uh, that's one thing that they're exploring here. Others, another is obviously network, the role of networks in the evolution and structure of city systems uh, they explore. So uh, there we have it, just a little bit of framing. Uh, what we're gonna do today is, uh, I'm not gonna talk all the time. Uh, we're gonna try and get some uh, collective wisdom here. We're gonna explore a couple of different questions uh, relating to this. We've got five boards here. The first one's around uh, what is, uh, each one poses the question and you're gonna post up your stickies. Um, you're gonna use the images on the board also to uh, spark your imagination in response to the question. I'll show you what those questions are in a minute. Um, I just want you to grab a sticky. You can see them here, uh, plonk it down and type in your response to the question. So we have five questions. Um, we can see them here. We'll take about 10 minutes for each. 
um, maybe two, three minutes for you to write down your responses, and then we'll take um, maybe five, eight minutes to discuss them. So uh, yeah, just to get an overview, first one is around what do we think uh, this urban complexity stuff is? What does it mean to take a systems perspective to cities? Uh, what, is, what are these kind of self-organizing processes? What do they look like? What's a networked uh, view of the world, of, of cities? How can that help us? And uh, how can we understand cities as complex adaptive systems? So that's what we'll be doing. Uh, we've just got an hour today, so we'll jump straight in. Um, the first one here is uh, posing this question. What is urban complexity? What does it mean to take a complexity approach to, to understanding design and development of cities? So I touched a little bit upon it there, but I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, please jump in now, grab yourself a sticky, uh, plonk it down there. Um, I'll give you about three minutes uh, to type up your response. You can uh, put one down, try to use the image to uh, think about um, your response and uh, type it up there and I'll come back to you. I'll set the timer. We'll take about three minutes or so, or four minutes to reply and then come back and discuss. Any questions? Happy to answer them. If you need help with Miro, let me know. We're just working on the first board here. Either one of these two images, you can put your response to. We could just place the stickies on the edge of the image so as to get them around the image, not to spread out, please. Like this, yep. Okay, just uh, one minute left and then we'll read through it.
Okay, let's take a look at uh, what we've got and uh, read through this. Um, let's set this again. So we set 10. So um, up here in the green, uh, who is this? Complexity has to do with a kind of nonlinear relationship happening between uh, basis components and the role of agents. Who is this? Sorry, my microphone was mute. It's me, uh, just, Do I don't know why it? I have no, my name, I have just a code. <laughs> no, worries. You know, every time is like that, you know, I have this <laughs> very strange code. I can, I can rename you. Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, Maxima, hopefully I got it right. Um, yeah, what do you think about, what do you think about this? Uh, you know, is basically is related with the fact that most of the time we investigated the city as, you know, just a matter of considering the uh, the basic component that makes something happening in a very static way. But this uh, correlation between components is not uh, linear and it's also the uh, correlation between components is more, uh, is more, is are more important than the components by itself. You know, mm -hmm. is the relationship between components make emerging some, com some property that is not included in any component itself. Mm -hmm. And this, in my opinion, is one of the most important thing that has to do with the complexity. Do you have an example of that, uh, Max? Uh, some basic, you know, you know, we use in our, in our uh, method methodology, we used to work with uh, the traditional way of analyzing um, the, the basic component we share in every part of the world that are in the city are built spaces or volumes, open spaces, links, and then we have type of uses. And, but the point is how to, with this uh, sort of, uh, with this very limited number of components, we have so many different uh, special arrangement. And that is the reason because the way that the components are arrange themselves make emerging something that is different. And so we mm. consider that we have some, uh, key property that we call key categories that make uh, uh, emerging some kind of quality qualitative characteristic of the of this of the urban space like you know uh, proximity uh, accessibility that is a way of uh, making this correlation between components making emerging a new level of organization that is mm -hmm. not included in any one of them directly mm. okay Great. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute too when we talk about self-organization emergence. Uh, let's stay going. A long, uh, never-ending and emerging process of shaping and reshaping communities. Who is this? Yeah, that's that's me. Um, I'm fascinated. I once saw a, a video of Geoffrey West from Santa Fe. Mm. And actually, actually, he stated that of all self-organizing systems, cities are actually the only ones who never die. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's for me really interesting thing, and they they kind of grow and decline and grow again. Uh, uh, so yeah, yeah uh, really fascinating. Very different from organizations, actually. Yeah, empires, kingdoms, nations, corporations—they all come and go, uh, but the city stays there. And it's interesting to ask why. And it's that it's kind of that uh, openness to it, isn't it? It's the fact that it never really closes off um, or maybe temporarily it closes off to certain things, but then it opens up again, it stays evolving and adapting. I think it's really that openness, isn't it? That keeps it evolving and changing over time, do, do you think? Yeah, yeah, or maybe even the, the enormous complexity of it and, the, and, and so many different uh, uh, groups and people that you actually mm. can't, <laughs> you can't mm. plan. Okay, so um, maybe there's something to be learned from that, right? Planning is our, our demise. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what we're saying there, isn't it? Um, design cities with dynamics uh, in mind, e.g. adaptation, no, adaptability of routes. Who's this? Uh, anybody want to talk on this? Uh, or we stay going? Okay. Um, Let's maybe choose our own color as we go through and stick with our color so we know who it is. Um, 
So design uh, interventions uh, versus what urban dwellers make of it. Who is this? Design intentions versus what urban dwellers make of it. Yeah, that's uh, that's me, Josh. What do you um, think? I think trying to represent the inherent complexity with the perhaps frequent failures in designing with a specific intention in mind and failing to understand how, uh, well, failing perhaps to, to see the system um, as a whole and um, one, one part of it, which would be, you know, how, how the humans or how urban dwellers use some of what is designed. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it, it's so complex that so many people fail at designing it properly. Yeah, or what maybe what you're trying to say is they fail at designing for emergence. I think that's what they fail at, isn't it? We, we, we design the thing, we design like this here, right? It's obviously designed and it's, it's, a, it's an ordered pattern and it's kind of working, but it's not adapting, responding, and enabling those people in that community to create, to harness their capabilities and their self-organizing capacities. That, I think it's that that we, we don't fail to design. We, we do designs all the time, right? We, it's just the kind of the harnessing and enabling aspect, do you think? Would you agree? Absolutely, which is in line with the point that, that I wrote right next to it. So mm. it's almost like, you know, just when you're building infrastructures, it's by definition something to a certain extent stable, um, mm, mm. It's, it's hard for it. Yeah, I mean, what? Mm. how do you design for emergence, I guess, is the big question. Yeah, Could, yeah but it doesn't, you know, the idea of re reverse infrastructure, which is you're, you're like, it, maybe we, maybe that's just our way of thinking, right? You think about um, providing Wi-Fi to Berlin, like, or, or telecommunications to Berlin, you think, oh, we're gonna have to lay down all these cables and all this stuff. and all these companies, but you know, actually they set up mesh networks too, so that people can share their Wi-Fi, and that's a reverse infrastructure. It's an infrastructure coming from the bottom up, you know. So I'm not saying that's always possible, but it's it's a lot to do with our way of thinking, isn't it? That we think, oh, we're going to have to do it in that kind of fixed planning a way. We don't necessarily think about the alternatives and possibilities for doing stuff uh, in a different way. Um, so cool. Let's jump onto another one here. Um, uh so yeah uh let's take this one here dealing with large loose uh, connector groups of people with many different uh perspectives sense uh making sense meaning and making is this you rick or who is this yeah yeah that's actually me um yeah so oop, then i have to go back to the question <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, what, what, what do we mean by urban complexity? Um, what is this approach? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. so about the approach. So what, what I kind of do or discovered is uh, actually trying to understand this, trying to, to gather a lot of different stories uh, from people. Mm. Uh, and, and all these stories start to make sense when you can find the, the underlying patterns and structures. So, so actually, it's a quite easy approach for, for starting to understand uh, the meaning making is, is probably a little bit more difficult. <laughs> and, yeah. and then the interventions and actions, uh, but it's, it's very powerful when, when a whole group of people actually start to think about that to make it a collective approach. Yeah, it's a very different from the way we think about cities, isn't it? We think about them more like uh, this uh, infrastructure and all of this, but of course, you could almost switch that paradigm and start from the other end and say, well, what's the meaning people are making out of this? Because that's obviously so important. What, what's the meaning they're giving to things and what's the kind of, what's the environment they'd like to live in? What would be a meaningful environment or an engaging environment for them? And then build something out of that uh, maybe, but I think it's a great point, stories, right? To collect what all these people are thinking and how they're seeing things. Um, so understand the city's a goal first, who is this? Anyone? Nope. Okay. So adapting to uh, a growing and changing population. Who is this? Yeah, also me. Um, I think just the the, the demographics. Um, are shifting. So I think 
Yeah, actually, I don't know. I can't put into words what I thought about this. Well, well, it is. Uh, I mean, we're we're getting the formation of these uh, mega cities, right? De demographics is growing around the planet, um, and uh, cities are people are urbanizing. More people are living in larger cities, um, and this is a huge uh, challenge. And it really re actually requires a paradigm shift because we get if we go on with the kind of old approach, which is the very kind of planning approach to things. Um, we create, you, you see it in these, you know, Mumbai and Mexico City and Sao Paulo and all these places, Indonesia, you get nicely designed urban centers, you know, but then when you go out to the suburbs where a whole pile of people have just arrived, you know, and they're piling in and we can't keep up with that. We can't keep up with that with our formal design, with our formal infrastructure and so forth. So that's one big reason why we really have to change the paradigm because there's so many people flocking into these mega cities, Kinshasa and um, wherever it is, Nairobi and, and so forth, Dhaka, around the planet, and our actual capacity to design in the way that we did in the past, you know, here in London, it's, a lot of it's perfectly organized, you know, because we had a long period of time to actually develop, uh, had good government, develop all that infrastructure in places like that, it's urbanizing so fast, they can't keep up with that with formal design. So it actually makes a lot more sense to switch that paradigm to one of kind of enabling self-organization and emergence to happen. A good example of that actually is in, in Lima in Peru, where they realized that they couldn't keep up with this. And what they did is, Lima is pretty much in the desert, and all they did was go up to the outskirts of the city and they knew millions more people were gonna join in the next 10, 20 years that they couldn't provide infrastructure for. So what they did is started marking lines in the sand and saying, okay, this is gonna be a road. This is where you can build your house. This is where we're gonna have a park. And that's all they did, laid it out, and then people could come and take that land and build it as, as they wanted, right? And then they said, once we have 10,000 people in this area, then we'll put in water, and 20,000 will put in electricity, so on and so forth. So it's a kind of a bottom-up, it's a totally different approach, and it's really the approach you need when you're going through massive urbanization, the way a lot of these cities are, and that is driven by um, huge population growth, particularly in these uh, developing economies. And that's one of the changes, like, uh, you know, there are changes such as in big, one of the big cities, um, I don't know, San Francisco and elsewhere, where it's also about just the um, spending power of, of, of residents. So that's sort of the shifting social and economic construct of the city itself, not necessarily just growing, but also, you know, things are changing in a way where it affects yeah. so many other things, um, costs, things rents, exactly. So. Berlin is yeah. also one where a lot of new newcomers are more, uh, you know, related to the startup scene. So there's another shift also to, to how the city is 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 reacting. Yeah. And there's a shift in terms of power too, also and kind of governance also, right? Ch yeah. Cities are changing their role in the world. They're becoming a lot more influential, a lot more powerful. Um, people talk about it quite quite a bit here in London that actually London doesn't have very much, you know, it's a 25% of the UK GDP and a lot of stuff, you know, there's one borough here, I talked to a guy yesterday, he works in the borough of Camden, and has a bigger GDP than Wales, you know, uh, but Wales gets its own government and Camden, which is this uh, borough of London, I think it probably has more population than, than, than uh, Wales also, but uh, we're in that paradigm of nation states, whereas these things are emerging um, and uh, they now, you know, coordinate massive amounts of resources and so forth. So it's changing power, changing governance and so forth um, that kind of needs to take place. Um, okay, so the next one here is um, thinking of the city as a system. What does it mean to, uh, what does holism mean in this context? How does it differ from a reductionist approach? So thinking holistically, how can that help us? Um, let's. Uh, Let's jump in here. What does it mean to take a systems approach? Uh, we'll take uh, four minutes or so to post up our stickies. Um, try to choose the same color as you did uh, last time.
So what we have here, city involve uh, many systems, including energy, water, and sewage, food, uh, transport, health, and biodiversity, as well as economic, social, and cultural systems. City is a system of systems. Who is this? Yeah, it's me. Mm. And so basically, is the is not enough to say that, uh, city is a system because it includes uh, different kind of systems or subsystem depending by you know the, the scale of what you look at but city is a system of systems all of them integrated through correlation that are not as i told before linear mm. and this is very relevant because if you consider the most of our uh, way of uh, planning and also dealing with the the problems uh, not don't used to be, uh, you know, in a holistic way. They yep. used to be made in a sort of silos approach. So we have department working on one of these um, for each system that I listed there, and no one, no one of them considering the fact that their uh, the change in their system is, uh, you know, is affecting or is creating in the other one. And this is one of the main, uh, you know, issues that we have to work with. It's also the way we kind of separate everything out in the city, don't we? If you think about it, like in this image, we can see a business yeah. district there. And then we've probably got another one that's residential. We have another one that's commercial. We have another one that's for recreation and so forth. And we separate everything out. And the, what are the consequences of doing that? Um, everything becomes one thing. You live in a block of um, apartments, right? Your residential area. And then you have to commute to go to... Uh, work and you go somewhere else for entertainment and so on and so forth and it's that way that we separate everything out and when we do that it enables us to focus like the argument for that would be well in the business district we can all focus on on, on business and work and so forth and over here we can focus on that but what happens is you lose the potential for synergies don't you like and that's you lose the potential for actually putting things together in ways that really spark amazing things because you've got all the same thing in one place and actually the paradigm is kind of naturally changing at the moment this idea of a 15 minute city where you can walk to you can go to everything in 15 minutes i'm not sure if that's the term they use uh, but it's a totally different paradigm it's the idea of integration isn't it? that maybe we don't want to put the business district all the way over there and that over there we want to put them all together so that we have everything within 15 minutes and we don't have to commute uh, a long distance and so forth um it's a kind of an integrated approach instead of a disintegrated approach. Um, okay, so uh, just yep. so so actually, your example is is you are changing the underlying rules of the system doing that, isn't it? You're like changing the, 15... the whole the whole yeah. paradigm, really, if you think about it, because the paradigm at the moment is economies of scale, right? It separate things out, and then if you have them all together, then you can do economies of scale. You know. Um, that's that's that that's the thing of centralizing things and separating them. You can focus and you can reduce unit cost, and that's how you 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 scale things and you do them at a low cost and so forth. But the fifteen minute city idea is totally different. It's the idea that um, it's integrated, so it's all there where we need it. But it's also in in the paradigm of synergy. The the value can come from connecting things together. You know, like a building not just being for residential. It can also be for energy. It can also be for climate mitigation it can also be for many different things um and yet you can you can get that synergy between them um okay so ho holism means uh, that's you again okay uh it's highly complex system with many subsystems and many layers is this you rick yeah yeah yeah, yeah it goes to the example of uh the first the purple one so it's it's really not about as an organization about one system with one purpose but it's many systems mm -hmm. with many purposes and many mm -hmm. different views uh, so that's why i'm interested in the underlying rules because that might be kind of a coordination of everything mm. it's a good point uh, the systems have different purposes we don't necessarily think about it in that way and how do those purposes align or misalign goes back to the synergies thing mm -hmm they can align and you can get synergies and they can kind of cooperate and work together or they can kind of uh, misalign, you know, transportation. What we do transport kind of misaligns with the interests of people in a living city and that we, 
that statistic, I'm not sure Mariana maybe has it about Paris being uh, 50 or 70 percent of its public space uh, being uh, given over to roads and cars. Um, that doesn't help the rest of us, does it? All mm -hmm. asking, you know, it's a negative synergy. The purpose of that system is misaligned with the purpose of a living, livable city. So how do we think about the alignment of those purposes? Um, it's not really the siloed approach. It's just the transport guys focus on what's best for them and the, the living city guys focus on what's best for them. They don't necessarily mm -hmm. really align those. Yeah. So it's an ecosystem, a network of systems uh, with complex entangled rela relationships. Yeah, I said that. Um, I think the word entangled is quite um, a useful one because Dave Snowden talks a lot about that with complexity, that, um, uh, that there's, there are systems where you can see all the components and there are systems where the things are so entangled that you can't you have no hope of really understanding it and you, you have to work with those with that with constraints rather than trying to come up with a design as such i think entanglement the word gets to the idea of interdependence doesn't it yes yeah which we haven't mentioned yet and it's obviously that's part of what cities about we cram all these people and all these systems together and we inevitably get huge interdependencies um, and that's something really key that we have to think about. Okay, um, so anybody else looking at the city as an ecosystem of interconnected actors with overlapping and maybe contradicting purposes and use of the ecosystem? I'm sort of basing this on, I mean, my, my foray into systems thinking in general, I started by looking at innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems back in 2015 uh, when I was doing my master's. And recently there's a study by MIT on uh, place-based innovation ecosystems. And it talks about that it's not only about the intersection or the, uh, uh, sorry, the, the different interconnected actors, but also the roles they play in helping the ecosystem reach its purpose. And when I try to translate that thinking into the city, I'm like, so what is the purpose and role of each of these actors and how do these roles and purposes come together? And on a grand scale is, you know, co-living in this space, we're gonna cram together, but on many other things, when you get to, um, yeah, into details, a lot of things might contradict actually. So. Uh, and how, how do you, I guess the other point is kind of, I think about control too, like how do you align them without control? Because we don't necessarily have a whole pile of control in cities. Maybe we have a mayor and so much, so forth, but they don't really have a lot of power in, in many ways, given the scale and complexity and all the different actors and the power of those different actors, right? The finance people there and, you know, the construction companies there. And these people have a lot of power and the mayors, they only have a little bit of power. So there's a certain lack of kind of control and that's one of the interesting things here, why it's kind of an ecosystem uh, thing, because we haven't got such kind of centralized strong control here. So how do you actually align those purposes in a world where you don't have that kind of really strong control over things? Um, it's part of the question of taking an ecosystem, thinking about it, all these interacting agents, how do we get coordination without uh, being able to really kind of impose that? You start getting some examples. I mean, I don't know, this is perhaps isolated, but um, of trying to bring together, um, you know, uh, younger people were in close to elderly homes and trying to mm. see how, so that, that would be one example of just like um, trying yeah. to, to facilitate the synergies between the both exactly. needs and purposes. But yeah, I think that's, that, that's. Well, it's well, a really good right. example of what, uh, what I was saying, right, about the way we separate things out. We put all the old people over there in their nursing homes and the young people go to school over there. And that's good, but we lose all the synergies, don't we? There's huge synergies between old people and young people. There's potential synergies between natural and artificial environments, but we lose all, a lot of that too. Um, so I think the idea of synergies is, is hugely important to all of this. Um, okay, let's jump on to the next board for the sake of time. Um, 
we will uh, try and capture this knowledge as we go forwards and maybe put it into kind of mind maps and uh, publish it so we're not losing all this but let's stay uh, going and talk about uh, self-organization in what sense are cities self-organizing systems what role does emergence play in the formation of, of cities so we've touched upon this a bit uh, but let's grab our, our stickies and uh, post up some thinking um, what role does it play, uh, emergence and self-organization in the formation of different patterns, uh, social, economic, technological, so on.
Okay, let's take a look at uh, some of these. Uh, so up here in the red, um, what do we have? Redesign for emergence of desirable results rather than op optimized parts. Who is this? That was me. Uh, it's on the no. previous question, right? Uh, redesign for the emergence of desirable results rather than the question here is on uh, in what sense are cities self-organizing or we're talking about self-organization and emergence sorry that was my response to the holism question okay let's see redesign for emergence of desirable results rather than optimize the parts i mean it's, it's relevant here too um because it's about designing for emergence Mm -hmm. rather than kind of planning for an ideal state. Yeah. Do you want to say, say anything, Marina? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the idea, it's the idea of, of bottom down and, and synergies rather than control. And um, it's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. that idea in a, in a, in a why, sense. Why do you think uh, we don't do this very much? Or do we? Do we do this very much, this kind of uh, designing for self-organizing stuff. If not, mm -hmm. why? Okay, I gradually we don't. Um, as you as you were mentioning before, we tend to separate, and we tend mm -hmm. to focus and look for economies of scales rather than actually uh, looking for synergies. I could argue that um, we don't do that much because we don't observe systems. We are not able to see systems, and we don't necessarily understand the role of synergies and emergence so i could take it back to the um, to the way of seeing the world in a way yeah well, there's a few different things and it? it's always good to kind of recognize what are the real constraints like why why don't we do this and i think it's partly about the paradigm our way of looking at the world um there's another aspect around control too, isn't that order? We love orderly systems and these self-organizing systems. Sometimes they look nice and lovely and we get those perfect flocks of birds, those starlings. Other times they look pretty messy, you know, and uh, we don't really like that. We're, quite often we just prefer to have a solution that delivers something, even if we're kind of cashing in and selling out on the possibility of getting real kind of a powerful coherence of a much more robust kind of self-organizing emergent system. I think that's maybe part of it also. Uh, but I think control is a big part of it too. Um, desire for order and predictability and control that kind of planning uh, gives us. Um, I'm sorry, right Joss, may, yep. sorry, may I, I say something? I think that we also have some problem of defining the problem. So the definition of the problem is uh, related with the fact that we simply consider a sort of tame problem and not the fact that our the problems that we are facing and the city is mm -hmm. one of the places where this is appearing in a more you know, relevant way are mostly wicked problems. And so we what, can... what do we do? What do you think we do? Uh, we ignore them or? Those wicked most problems. of the time we ignore or we choose to have a sort of shortcut to consider mm. that if the problem is not considered as a wicked one uh, mm. the solution that might be indicated is easier to be probably to be trust you know mm. and we try to we take a complex problem a wicked problem and we try to reduce it down to one part of that problem don't we and then we say okay that's the problem we can go and fix that and it's simple enough that we can use our linear kind of management methods um and everybody gets excited and they make a bit of progress and we get nice results and numbers and everything but at some point we realize well we we, we just avoided the, the the real problem the real problem's still there it's the elephant in the room right yeah exactly okay um so uh, what's this here? The, uh, they are the results of the interactions of different uh, systems and people. Anybody want to pick up on that? That was me again, actually. This was my response to the, to the question. Um, yeah, the idea that, the idea that um, actually the, the city gets to a level of, of complexity, to, to a pattern of organization, uh, that comes again from the from the from the bottom up, bottom up 
and, and the interactions between people and between the different systems within a city. Mm. The results of the interactions of different systems and people. And yeah, how those un interact in sometimes unexpected ways. I think it's an aspect of also surprise and unexpected. When we talk about emergence, it's almost always surprising. It's also about creativity too, isn't it? The way things interact in, 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 the, in ways that we didn't plan them to interact. And something new kind of happens there. Um, and quite often our plan, it doesn't fit into our plan. So what do we do? We get rid of it, right? Um, we see it as a failure or, or a problem or something like this. So that's interesting. How could we, how could we create something that uh, captures that spontaneity of creativity and incorporates it into the system and enables it to develop? And even, even create those spaces where that can happen, right? I think that's part of what we're talking about. We talk about innovation ecosystems or something like this. They're all about creating spaces, events or co-working spaces or whatever, where different people, different systems, whatever, interact and we get something new forming there. And then we kind of enable that and uh, nourish it to grow into something new. Um, but could a whole kind of city be like that? Could we design create a structure for a whole kind of city, not some specialized little part of it uh, that was actually able to, to do that. I think that's kind of a very advanced form of design that's kind of beyond, to, to a large extent, beyond our capacities at this stage, just because our thinking, but also our whole kind of design approach and a whole management approach to um, the way all of that works really maybe could enable this in small little piecemeal ways, but not really in a kind of powerful and robust way. Yeah, and, and just maybe to add to that, these, these spaces, these interactions that could be created could also help to what Rick was mentioning about sense making in a way, uh, kind of having a fuller picture of, of or and a shared uh, uh, idea of, of, of the world, actually. Yeah, and even imagine just spaces like that little image there where people come together and this is a space where we make sense of things together. Um, like, do, do we have those? How many of those do we have? I mean, you know, a lot of people talk about how our cities have become under neoliberalism and so forth. They've become so much private kind of entities. Some cities in China, in Hong Kong, Shenzhen, everywhere you go, all you get is a security guard uh, kind of watching you. Um, and this is private property here. Could you please move on? And that's 90% uh, of what you're dealing with. Um, what about spaces? where people come together and make sense of things and how they might change things. Okay, um, so uh, what we got here more, I think it could be a more dynamic system. Certainly, you know, planning almost always leads to kind of a fixed system. It's very tempting planning some ideal stage in the future that we work towards and then we constrain and we control all the parts to try and get there. Um, actually, this is dealing with now, really, isn't it? David Snowden talks about it, the evolutionary potential of the system now, instead of some idealized state in the future that we move towards, um, how do we deal with spontaneous little things like this crowd of people coming together and interacting and enable them to grow into something instead of saying, no, we have a plan of what this is gonna be about and we we can't we can't we can't uh, deal with that stuff. We need to move forward with our plan here. So this is a much more dynamic one because it's thinking about the now, or what's here and now, what's the potential now, and how could the system really evolve forwards and stay continuously evolving instead of trying to achieve some ideal state, some ideal fixed state. Emergence is about trusting citizens and their self-organizing capacity. Um, although the right connections need to be set. Okay, for the sake of time, guys, uh, we're kind of running out. So let's just do uh, this last one. Um, and then we can come back at a future session to pick up on the other ones. Uh, this one's talking about networks. Uh, cities as networks, it's long been recognized. Cities are networks. Look at this, New York City. Quite beautiful, these networks, aren't they? The way they capture all this complexity and all the detail, uh, amazing, 
amazing stuff. This is Brooklyn here. Incredible. So let's jump in here and take our last five minutes to try and answer this question. How can network theory help us to understand a system? So let's just talk about how networks help us think about and potentially design uh, systems. Let's grab some stickies and jump into that and take a few minutes. Okay, so let's just jump in because um, we're almost uh, at time's end. So um, physical network and virtual network. Uh, Nadim, was this you? Yeah. Um, yeah, it just makes me think of, I mean, I'm thinking of both things at the same time, the flows of goods, people, knowledge, culture, also data. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it just made me it think. It's incredibly of... complex, doesn't it? <laughs> it it's is. Incredibly... It's uh... it's mind mind expanding, really, when you think about it. It's like um, we're normally just even a, a network like this, we find it quite complex, right? But it's just an incredible simplification of, as you say, multi-dimensional 
all these networks intersecting, interacting, it's just almost beyond our complexity to imagine. Makes me think of the multi-layered approach to a city when, when you need exactly. to. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you do much of this, Maximo, that kind of modeling of multi-dimensional networks? Or? Did you? How's your audio? You're on mute. Sorry, just I didn't get you. I was just asking, we're talking about these kind of multi-dimensional networked way of looking at cities. Yeah. I was wondering if you do any of this work of kind of modeling like that. You know, uh, one of the best examples that I have in mind is the work that at UCL uh, Space Syntax used to do with this kind of, uh, you know, modeling. Everyone mm -hmm. of us, I suppose, know very well what they, they, they do in this, uh, you know, in this topic. And I think that this make a very clear the way of in the investigating the relationship between, uh, you know, between different system and also the the fact that emerge some characteristic that is not totally uh, or even not at all comprehensible if we look at the yeah. at the city with the traditional tools. That is a very good, interesting tool for understanding the characteristic of the system. Mm. Amazing, isn't it? I mean. Um, okay, so just starting to map the city and uh, the connections together might be a huge first step in seeing and understanding the complexity of a system, shifting mindsets. Yeah, it's always the beginning, isn't it? Just uh, helping humans to recognize complexity. Is this you, Rick? Or? Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think actually, uh, so for instance, we as a group have quite good, uh, start to have quite good understanding of this, but. Uh, so what I see also in municipalities, you know, people are so used to the old way of doing things and just starting to make a map that, mm. that turns them around in their thinking. Yep. Just showing a map as you are doing now from New York, you know. It's... Yeah. Instead of, instead of saying, oh, that's that department and that's over there in that department and this is my box and yeah. Yeah. So the... We'll... the Probably the huge challenge is how, how to get all these people in a room, you know, and make them curious and, and start to, to explore. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, I think the, you know, one of the most interesting things is when you put it as a, as a, as a network, you start to think about the flows, don't you? Like this should never be straight away. It's like the veins in our body. It's like the, you know, the way water travels down through a valley out to the sea, you know, a delta or something, the way it finds the flow pathways that optimize its kind of flow same for the body same for all these kind of network flow systems they're really looking for optimize the flows in the system um and you start, so when you take this networked approach that's what you start to see straight away instead of just like accumulations of things and how we measure the increase or decrease in the parts we start to think about how do things flow through the system i mean transport's an obvious one but of course, there are many other kind of flows in this system. How does how does information flow through this system? Um, actually, is an interesting question. Um, yep. Okay, so um, let's leave it there for now, for the sake of time. Um, really interesting discussion, guys. Uh, thank you very much for for joining, and I want to keep this going. Uh, maybe a month from now, we'll do another one. Um, but uh, great to start this and uh, look forward to continuing it. We were just talking a bit kind of theoretical, the complexity theory stuff this time. Uh, in the future, we can talk more about uh, the innovation side and, and other dimensions to all of this. Um, but it's great to get started. And uh, let's leave it uh, for now. And um, I'll see you all again. And in, in a month or so, I'll keep you posted on, on LinkedIn if you find us on LinkedIn or, or on the website. I will keep you posted um, about upcoming events. We'll do this again in another month. Um, yeah, let's.